Amen. Thank you, Richard. That was really, really well read, friends. It's great to get to be with you this morning. Uh, my name is Charlie Dunn. Along with John, I have the privilege of getting to pastor this new neighborhood church in Lake Highlands. And if you've been with us for the past few weeks, you know that uh, we've been in this series reading through the Gospel of Luke. It's a series called Eating with Jesus. And so we've been talking a lot about food. And food is probably one of the easiest things to talk about, even with somebody that you've never met before. You know, Pete Townsend is a part of this congregation, and Pete travels a lot to Asia. He's told me that whenever he wants to strike up a conversation, even with somebody on the other side of the world that he's never met before, he just asks them about food. Tell me, what's your favorite food? What's the best food in this area? Where should I go to eat? People always have something to share about their favorite food to make or their favorite food um, to buy at a restaurant. It's easy to talk about food. We love talking about food. We even love watching food. You know, there's there's a channel, there's a network that's devoted to food all the time. Maybe some of you have watched the Food Network before, and maybe you have a favorite Food Network show like Chopped or Diners and Drive-Ins and Dives or the Great British Baking Show. If anybody's ever watched that show, it is so soothing to listen to the British accents in that show. I mean, if you want to take a nap or just feel like a nicer person, they're so kind to each other, even though they're competing with one another. But probably my favorite Food Network show is a show called Restaurant Impossible. Anybody ever seen that show before? It's recently come back on. I haven't gotten back into watching it, but here's the premise of the show. You've got these these failing American restaurants. The decor is dated and drab. The menu is overwhelming. The food tastes like somebody just pulled it out of the freezer, put it in the microwave, and then slapped it onto the plate. And the business is is failing, all the the, the back, behind-the-scenes aspects. And so you've got this this no-nonsense chef named Robert Irvine. He's a former British Navy chef. And so he goes into these restaurants, and he calls them out. He says, you're doing this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. And, And he gives them a plan, and he says, if you will follow this plan, we've got 48 hours before a grand reopening, we're going to turn this restaurant around, and it seems impossible. Except episode after episode, it always seems to work out, which is part of why I grew tired of watching the show, because sure enough, they always turn it around. It wasn't as impossible as maybe it seemed. And yet here in Luke chapter 9, that Jesus is confronted with a genuine restaurant impossible sort of situation. So Jesus actually takes his disciples. He wants some time away. He wants some privacy, a chance for them to have a bit of a spiritual retreat. But people were so drawn to Jesus. They were so attracted to Jesus that they they followed him out into this more desolate region. Literally thousands of people are, are flocking to Jesus, and they've been with him all day as he's been teaching and healing. And, and now comes a time where they're hungry. And the disciples, they recognize this. They say, Jesus, you need to let these people go. They need to go home so they can get some food. And yet here in this desolate place with with at least 5,000 men, not to mention even women and children, Jesus decides that it's time to host a feast. He decides it's time to cater a banquet. And so Jesus says, no, we're going to feed these people. And what he does is he proceeds to take just two fish and five loaves of bread, and to multiply it. So that as the disciples begin to give out this food, it multiplies and multiplies so that 5,000 people, at least, if not more, are not only able to eat, but they are satisfied. They're full. And there's even leftovers at the end of the feast. It's utterly miraculous. And yet maybe for some of you, Or maybe for some of your friends or your family members, maybe this is part of what makes it so hard for you to believe in Christianity. Maybe you struggle to to believe in a a miraculous event of this nature. You say, you know what, I, I can believe this stuff about loving my neighbor. That seems like a good thing this call to be less selfish in my life. I even can believe that maybe there's a God who loves me, who wants a relationship with me. I can see how that could be really meaningful and comforting, but but I'm a thoughtful person. I'm a rational person. 
How am I supposed to, to believe that, that this sort of miracle could happen, that literally you could just have two fish and five loaves and suddenly it becomes enough food to feed 5,000 people? I mean, it defies the laws of nature. It defies the law of the conservation of matter. Does anybody remember that from high school chemistry? What does that law say? It says that you can do a chemical reaction. You can change matter, but in the process, you can neither add nor destroy matter. There's a fixed amount of matter in the universe, and yet this food keeps emerging. It keeps showing up so that everybody is able to eat and to be satisfied. How am I supposed to believe that a miracle like that could really take place? And, and you know, I actually think that's a pretty reasonable question. I think it's a pretty thoughtful question that people who are exploring the Christian faith encounter, maybe that some of you have asked before. So before we get into the meaning of this meal, and there are a lot of layers of significance to this feeding of the 5,000. We're going to get into that. But first, I feel like we need to respond to this objection. How am I supposed to believe in this sort of miracle? And I think there are, are two responses that I want to offer to that this morning. We'll call them the Lennox response and the Luke response. So let me, let me give you first the Lennox response. Anybody ever heard of John Lennox? John Lennox is a professor of mathematics and a professor of the philosophy of science at Oxford University. So he's no dummy. He's a pretty bright guy. And, and, and as, as John Lennox responds to this objection, do the miracles of Jesus defy the laws of nature? Here's what he would say. He says, let me give you this illustration. Imagine that you're traveling to England. You're in his home country. And, and while you're there in your hotel room, one night you put 10 British pounds into the drawer of your hotel dresser. He says, the next night you put 10 more pounds into that drawer. Well, then the third day you come back to the drawer, you open it up, and you find that there are now only five pounds in that dresser drawer. He says, what are you going to conclude? Are you going to conclude that the laws of arithmetic have been defied? That now 10 plus 10 doesn't equal 20, it only equals 5. No, you're not going to conclude that the laws of arithmetic have been broken. You're going to conclude that the laws of England have been broken. <laughs> that somebody has broken into your room and into your drawer, and they've taken 15 of your pounds. He says, the thing is, is that your hotel room, it's not a closed system. Meaning that somebody could come in from outside that room and alter things within it. And he says in the same way, if there's a God who created this universe, then our universe is not a closed system. Meaning that, yes, God created the, the laws of nature, the regularities with which nature normally operates, but the God who created the universe, who brought matter into existence, and who created those laws is no more a prisoner of the laws of nature than the thief would be a prisoner of the laws of arithmetic. And you see, if Jesus is who he really claims to be, who does Jesus claim to be? The Son of God, the creator of the universe, the one who brought all of matter into existence. If that's who Jesus really is, then he's able to create new matter. He's able to multiply this food. He's able to do a miraculous work within the world that he made. So there's the Lennox response. I think it's a pretty good one. But, but here's Luke's response. And Luke's response is, is even deeper. It gets more to the core of what's really going on in this miracle that Jesus performs. Because Luke helps us to see that when Jesus multiplies this food, it's not so much that Jesus is, is revealing this naked power that he has as the Son of God, but he's showing us the redemptive purpose of his power as the Messiah. If you were to read through Luke chapter 9, you might notice that this story is sandwiched. To stick with the food theme, it's sandwiched between two pieces of bread. And what are those two pieces of bread? They're questions about Jesus' identity. Who is Jesus? Luke is very intentional where he places this miracle scene. Right before this story, we're told that King Herod has been asking this question. Gosh, all these people are flocking to Jesus. Who is this guy? Is he Elijah? Is he John the Baptist raised from the dead? Is he one of the Old Testament prophets come back to life? Who is Jesus? And then Jesus performs this miracle, and he's with his disciples, and they're, they're, they're posing that same question. He asks them, who do the people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? 
And what does Peter respond? He says, you are God's Messiah. The identity of Jesus. Now, here's the question. What is it about the feeding of the 5,000? What is it about this incredible miracle that Jesus performs as he hosts this feast in a desolate place? What is it about that miracle that clues Peter in, that clues the other disciples in to Jesus' identity, to discovering who he really is? I would suggest this morning, more than any other meal that we've looked at together over the last few weeks, this is the meal that really reveals who Jesus is and what it is that he has come to do. Well, what is that? Well, you know, if you go back 800 years before this event ever took place, there was a prophet named Isaiah. God spoke through this prophet Isaiah about what was known as the Messianic Banquet. There was this promise that there was a day that was going to come when God was going to send his Messiah into the world. And he was going to host a feast of rich food for all the peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. He was going to host this, this wonderful banquet and meal, but the best thing about this meal is that it would never end. You never had to leave this feast because on the menu was going to be death itself. Isaiah says that at this feast, the Messiah would destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples. The sheet that covers all nations, he will swallow up death forever. Isaiah says there's coming this day when God's Messiah is going to do away with death. He's going to make everything right in the world. And he's going to make it possible for us to dwell in the presence of God forever. And you see, in this, in this feast that Jesus hosts in the wilderness, uh, suddenly, suddenly it's like something incredible is taking place. On this one day in history, think about this, as we're told that Jesus welcomes the crowds. That, that word is very intentional that Luke uses. It's like he's, he's welcoming people to a banquet. He's welcoming them to a feast. He welcomes them. Then what's Jesus doing? He's teaching them about the kingdom of God. Do you remember if you were here last week, we said the kingdom of God is the healing and renewing rule of God brought to bear in the world. Jesus is saying, that's what I've come to do. I've come to heal and restore your relationship with God, to heal and renew all that is broken. He's been teaching about the kingdom of God. He's been giving evidence of that healing through the healing as he's been healing people who are sick and, 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 and helping people to be restored, maybe who are crippled or have different infirmities. And, and, and then what does Jesus do? Jesus, when, when the disciples are ready to send people away, he says, no, you don't need to leave. You don't have to go. The party can continue as he provides this food. It's, it's, it's a feast that people don't have to leave. And at the end of the feast, there's more food at the end than there was at the beginning. Do you see, this feast has the makings of a perpetual feast. It has the makings of a messianic banquet. And there's something about this, this feeding as Jesus provides this food to these literally thousands of people that clues Peter in, that clues in the disciples, that actually clues in the crowds. We're told in John chapter 6 that after this event took place, that the people, they actually wanted to make Jesus king by force because they began to see this guy is the Messiah. There's something about this feast that, that reveals Jesus' identity as the Messiah who has come to restore what is broken in this world. And you see, friends, that's really the purpose of Jesus' miracles. Have you ever thought about that before? I mean, Jesus' miracles, they weren't just a way to show off, just to tell everybody, look, I'm the Son of God. Look what I can do. Frankly, if Jesus had wanted to do that, he could have done more spectacular miracles, couldn't he? Maybe like a fireball that would come out of his hand that he could shoot at a tree and everybody would say, wow, clearly this guy is the son of God. I mean, maybe do a few laps, a few circles flying over the Sea of Galilee. He could have done some far more spectacular miracles. He doesn't do that, does he? He heals people who are sick. He feeds people who are hungry. His miracles are not meant to show the naked fact of his power. They're meant to reveal the redemptive purpose of his power, his identity as the Messiah. In many ways, the miracles of Jesus, they're not suspensions of the natural order. 
They're actually the restoration of the natural order. You think about the world when God created it. God did not make a world with hunger. He didn't make a world with starvation and famine and sickness and disease and death itself. And what Jesus has come to do is to renew and restore God's intention for the world. His miracles are restoring that natural order rather than suspending or defying it. And you see, friends, that's the, that's the primary purpose then of Jesus' miracles, to reveal his identity as the Messiah who will renew and restore what's broken in the world. And can I tell you this morning that if you believe in those miracles, if you believe this really happened, you believe in the miracles of Jesus, more importantly, if you believe in what they point to, that day, that future renewed world when God's going to restore everything that's broken, that's not going to make you a more gullible person. It'll make you a more hopeful person, a person who's able to look at the suffering and the hunger and the longing in our world, the suffering and the hunger and the longing in our lives, and instead of it leading you into despair, instead of it making you hopeless and cynical, you're going to be able to face that. You're going to be able to endure that. You're going to be able to keep putting one foot in front of the other, working for good in this world, because you know that day's coming when God is going to renew and restore everything broken in our world. And you see, that's the primary purpose of this miracle. Jesus uses this messianic banquet, and it's not the real thing, by the way. The messianic banquet, that's still coming. This isn't actually the messianic banquet, but it's a glimpse. It's a sneak preview of that day when Jesus will heal and renew all things. And that's what this miracle points to, his identity as the Messiah. But I want us to see and to notice, while that's the primary purpose of the miracle, I want us to notice that in the way that Jesus goes about doing this miracle, I want us to notice three things in how he does this miracle by way of application that I think are really significant if you want to participate in Jesus' kingdom. And if you want to invite other people into it. So, so what are those three things? Notice them with me. First, what, would you notice that Jesus, even as he, he gives out this food, that he chooses to distribute the food through his disciples? You, you remember the exchange. The disciples come to him and they say, look, Jesus, these people have been with you all day. We're tired. They're tired. Please just let them go home and get their own food. That's a pretty reasonable request, isn't it? I mean, this coming from a guy who, who once had a bunch of church volunteers over at my home for dinner, I told them, I said, hey, feel free to stick around after dinner for a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> and people picked up on that. They were like, okay, we get it. You want us to leave. And I've tried to get better at being more hospitable since then. But I think the disciples have a pretty reasonable request here. They're like, Jesus, send these people home. They're hungry. And, and, and what does Jesus say to them? He says, you give them something to eat. In other words, Jesus asks them to do what is utterly impossible. I mean, it would be hard enough to try to cater a feast for 5,000 people. Just imagine the logistics that would go into that. But imagine trying to do it without any food. Jesus very intentionally asks them to do something that is impossible. That's his point, right? Because what Jesus is saying is that until you see that what I'm calling you to do is impossible, you are going to be utterly unqualified to be able to do it. You know, if Jesus had wanted to, he could have done an Albus Dumbledore. Anybody ever seen Harry Potter? You know, he just, he just waves his arms, and suddenly these gleaming, beautiful trays of food just emerge, and everybody says, wow. I mean, Jesus could have done that, couldn't he? But he doesn't do that. Instead, he, he sends the disciples out. He takes the food that they already have, which is inadequate, right? It's, it's not enough food. It's just two fish and five loaves. Jesus takes the food that they already have, and, and, and yet he, as he sends them out, as they trust him to multiply and to provide through that food, he does. And, and I think what Jesus is, is teaching his disciples and what he's teaching us it is that until you see that what God is calling us to do is impossible in and of ourselves, we are utterly unqualified to do it. That our adequacy comes only through him. I remember when I was getting ready to graduate from seminary, I'd spent four years in school and 
Uh, I was writing a paper in a Starbucks one night, and I remember having this sense of panic uh, that came over me. Uh, Because I thought to myself, I feel so unprepared to be a pastor. Uh, There are so many things about the Bible I don't know, so many things about people I don't know, so many uh, difficult counseling situations. I would feel like I wouldn't have the first idea how to respond to them. And and there was this sense of panic that came over me. And I remember this night really distinctly because it's one of the the few times when I felt like God really spoke to me. It wasn't an audible voice, uh, but there was just this clear thought that entered into my mind as if God was saying to me, Charlie, I want you to have to depend upon me. I don't want to make you into this self-sufficient person who has everything that you need to do what I'm calling you to do. I want you to have to learn to depend upon me. And I'm going to provide you what you need, but I'm going to give that to you just in time so that you will learn to depend upon me as you do. And friends, here's the thing. If, If you go out into this world to do whatever it is that God is calling you to do. You know, Jesus was preparing his disciples for the day he was going to leave. And he was going to send them out to have a far more difficult task even than feeding these people without food. He was going to give them the task of sharing the message that this crucified and risen Messiah was actually the Son of God and the Savior of the world. He was going to give them a far more difficult task. But if you go out sharing that hope with other people and you know If anybody's going to buy this and believe this, it's going to take a miracle. Or if you look at all the brokenness in this world, and yet you try to work to bring real healing in those places of brokenness, and you say, gosh, this is going to take a miracle. But only then, only if you recognize your inadequacy, only if you recognize how dependent upon God you are, will then Jesus show up and work through you and, and work his restoring miraculous power through you as you serve him. And let me get specific here. Let me apply this in one specific way. We said that really the biggest hope for this series, Eating with Jesus, is that we would increasingly become people who, like Jesus, are willing to invite others to our tables. When was the last time that you invited a coworker to lunch or to go grab coffee? Or when was the last time that you invited one of your neighbors over to your home for a meal? We said that's one of the best ways to forge friendship, even to to lean into potential spiritual conversations. When was the last time you did that? We said that's one of our biggest goals for this series. If everybody in this church would just invite one person, invite one for the fall season over the next couple of months together, just how might God work? if we were willing to invite people to our tables in that way. And yet I feel like there are a lot of us maybe who we hear that and we think, yeah, it would be great if other people were doing that more. But I don't want to do that, and I can't do that for all these different reasons. Maybe you say, well, I I just don't know if I'm social enough, I'm outgoing enough, or I wouldn't know what to say, or I have no idea how to turn a conversation toward God. I don't know enough about the Bible, or maybe my house isn't nice enough, my house isn't big enough, my dishes aren't nice enough, I'm not a good enough cook, my schedule is too busy. You could come up with all sorts of different reasons. And I think Jesus is just saying, what do you have? Do you have two fish? Do you have five loaves? Give that to me. Whatever you have, and I'm willing to work through that to do miraculous things in and through you as you are willing to be faithful and to step out and to be obedient. We don't save people. Jesus does. We don't solve people's problems. Jesus does. But our job is to step out and to to believe that he's going to provide as we're willing to invite people into our lives and to see how Jesus works as he does. So there's the first point of application. And you say, oh boy, there are two more. I thought we're going to be here forever. I promise they get shorter. Here's the second. Notice that Jesus, even though he's the creator of all things, he's the Messiah, he's going to do away with hunger and famine itself in this world. Notice that before he serves this food, what does he do? He gives thanks for it. He prays. Is that true in your life? Is that a ritual, a rhythm for you? When you sit down to eat a meal, do you take time to give thanks to God for that food? You know, I think that probably in Jesus's ancient world, people probably knew not to take their food for granted as much as we might today. They knew they were less, a little bit less secure in where their next meal might come from. You and I, though, I mean, we, we go to the grocery store. 
That's where our daily bread seems to come from. And yet Jesus teaches us, I think, to pray in this way, especially for us today, not because we don't know where our next meal will come from, but because we do know where it will come from. That we, we especially need this, this ritual, this rhythm of reminding ourselves that everything that we have comes from God and praying before a meal is just such a great opportunity to remind ourselves of our dependence upon him. And, and especially, let me say, if, if you want to get serious about uh, trusting Jesus, inviting people into your life, stepping out, recognizing your inadequacy, but trusting Jesus to, to, to draw people toward him as you invite them into your life. Can I tell you, if you invite somebody to your table, one of the best ways to be able to bring God into that conversation is to pray before the meal. Um, I, I talked to somebody in this congregation. He told me he got a new job recently. And you know, when you get a new job, you don't know your coworkers. You want to make a good impression. You want them to like you. One of them invited him out for a business lunch. He said before the meal, he worked up the courage to say, hey, would you mind if I were to give thanks for this food? And his coworker said, sure. And he prayed, and it turned out that his coworker was a Christian. It was, it was an opportunity for them to bond and connect at a level that wouldn't have been the case had he not been willing to do that. Uh, Brandy's told me before about a, a coworker of hers, and, and, and she, she went to lunch, invited this coworker to lunch, and, and then she asked if she could pray. She did, and she prayed for this coworker. And afterwards, she said, The coworker said to her, We are friends for life because anybody who will pray for me is a friend. Regardless of what she believed about God, it's an opportunity to love and bless somebody. When you can, you can ask God's blessing over them. I, I told some of you last week, my, my sister and brother-in-law were in town last week. They would both describe themselves as atheists. The whole week long, I was afraid to pray before the meals. I didn't want to make them uncomfortable. And, and, and so I would just sort of pray silently to myself. I, we got to the very last meal, and I finally worked up the courage, and I said, can I, can I give thanks for the food? And they said, sure. And it was like this holy moment. It's like God was suddenly brought into the table, into that, that situation as we were able to express just our love and our gratitude for them by, by speaking that out loud to God, by, by thanking him for his grace, even in giving us food that tastes better than it needs to, and, and his grace to us ultimately in Jesus. There's an opportunity to bring God into your conversations, to your table with others when you pray. And to do so even by yourself when you're alone, to take that time to give thanks just as Jesus does, it will allow you to enjoy God more, to enjoy other people more, and certainly to enjoy your food more as we do. Frankly, if Jesus needed to pray and to give thanks, don't you think that we do too? And then here's one last thing. One last thing. The way in which Jesus provides this bread to the crowds of people Luke shows us that it points forward to the greater provision of Jesus himself for us. Did you notice the language that Luke uses as he describes what Jesus does at this miracle? He, he takes the bread. He gives thanks for it. He breaks it, and then he gives it to his disciples. Does that language sound familiar? And just a few chapters later, describing the, the, the meal that Jesus shared with his disciples right before he was betrayed. What happens there? Luke gives us that same language. Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Taking, thanking, breaking, giving. And you see, Luke, he wants us to make that connection. He wants us to see that Jesus, yes, he is the Messiah. Yes, he's the one who will host this messianic banquet. But why are we able to be included in that banquet? Why is a good and just God able to welcome broken sinners like you and me into that banquet? You know, right after Peter says, Jesus, you're the Messiah, Jesus begins to explain that he would suffer and that he would die that he would face the judgment that you and I deserve to face on the cross so that we could be welcomed into the messianic banquet. And you see, in the way in which Jesus provides this bread for the crowds, it's actually pointing forward to the greater provision of himself for us when he would say, this is my body given for you. 
Would you take and eat in remembrance of me? So let's pray as we come to the Lord's table together this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you 